The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So what's been important the last couple of lectures? Christina. Uh, transfer functions. Transfer functions. All right. How about something else? Modal coordinates. Modal coordinates. And I'll expand that to call this modal analysis in general. Anything else? Anything? Uh, well, I'll think more about that. And are there any questions for the week? You know, what are anything muddy, fuzzy, not quite clear to you that if I have time to say a few words about today, you'd like me to talk about? Um, so I guess I'm a little bit confused with, um, so like what we did in class is nodal analysis. Mm -hmm. um, is that just like so um, when we did? Originally, like Newton's law, and then, um, and then we did like the kinetic and stuff. So, like, um, is that sort of similar here, where we can do either like the oh. equation of motion, or we can <laughs> do like the analysis? Like, is it like a is modal analysis a, an alternative way yeah, of the analogy isn't too helpful, but. Modal analysis is one way of attacking the equations of motion that describe vibration of linear systems. You can work through the entire analysis and figure out the solution to the equations of motion. The unusual with these multiple degree of freedom vibration problems, you can cast them as a mass matrix times an acceleration vector plus a stiffness matrix times a displacement vector equals some forcing function, right? So these are, and we linearize them, and we know they're for vibration problems. We can solve these equations using modal analysis, or we can solve them brute force directly without breaking the, the results into their modal contributions. And, and, and so there really are two kind of approaches that you can use to doing it. So, that, okay. any other kind of questions? Yeah. So, for like a definition of motor shape, is the motor shape just the ratio of the two amplitudes? Or In the case of a two degree of freedom system, so mode shapes. For mode n. an n degree of freedom system like let's say n equals 3 here. So for mode n, the mode shape, and uh, we, you have to, uh, you always have to present some normalization. I do the normalization oftentimes by just saying, okay, I'm going to make the top coordinate, I'm going to give it unit amplitude. And so that's, I'm going to take a1 and divide it by itself, and that'll give me a 1. And then every other one becomes a2 over a1, a3 over a1. The mode shape says if this is then uh, 1 minus a half and a quarter, it says that if, mo if, if coordinate, generalized coordinate 1 moves a unit amount, Generalized coordinate 2 will move half of that in its, in the opposite, in its, in its negative direction. This could be an x, a displacement, and that could be a rotation. But they all have positively defined directions, right? So if there's a positive 1 at x1, there's a minus a half at generalized coordinate 2, and there's a plus a quarter at generalized coordinate 3, and that ratio stays constant for 
the mode. And if, so if you have, uh, if it's an initial condition problem and you set it up so that it, you actually give it, and ex give it just an initial displacement of exactly that shape, it'll sit there and vibrate only in that mode. And you'll notice that it will, ex that the proportion, even as it dies out with damping, the proportion of the first to the other two stays exactly constant. That's what a mode is. And it's a character, it's a property of the system. The natural frequency is a property and the shape of every mode is a property of that system. Okay, anything else, questions? Next lecture, we'll do more modal analysis. We did the response to initial conditions yesterday. Tuesday, we'll talk about the response to external forces. And that gives us a chance to review it and post it on Stellar. Uh, last night, I put up a little two-page sheet that is a cookbook, how to do the procedure of a modal analysis. It's very cookbook, you know, it's just step by step, bang, 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 and everything, gets, everything falls out. Any other questions? Yeah. So is that where we get the mode shape from? Is that where you, you, you get the mode shape by solving the characteristic, if you're doing it by hand, by solving the characteristic equation, which we're going to get some practice at today. So I think this is the exercise of today, is how to get natural frequencies and mode shapes. You mean like actually drawing the, you know, after the, like the mode shape, like actually drawing some sort of graph? <laughs> As in a graph that shows the displacement of it or it shows the time history? Either. Right? Well, a diff difference. in the book, like, they, <coughs> they have, like, mode shape, but actually using this, they draw a certain graph. Sometimes they do. If it's easy, you know, like for a vibrating string, it's easy to draw the mode shape. And the piece that they also see. Right? Mm, yeah, when, and so vibrating string, if first mode vibration looks like half a sine wave. The mode shape is just half a sine wave going up and down in space. For uh, this system, the mode shape is two, amp two different amplitudes of these two bobs. And their relative motion, we're going to figure that out today. OK, we better get going or we won't finish. So the uh, good questions. And here's, the, here's this, this system simplified just into two bobs and massless strings. Here's the equation to motion for that. Linear, they've been linearized already. There's no sine thetas or anything. And as part of the linearization, so you understand, this assumes then small amplitudes, right? It not only did the sine, you know, the torque for a pendulum, you get this MGL sine theta term. And so the linearization, you say small angles, sine theta becomes theta. So that gives, that's where this, this G over L sine theta has become theta term. There's another assumption that's been made to model this system. We're essentially modeling this system. And that is for small angles, we're assuming the spring remains horizontal. Because if it, the spring puts a force on the rod, right? And what you want is the torque about that point. These two equations are the equations for torque about that point and about that point. And if the, the torque is the spring force times that distance. And if they're perpendicular, it's just, that's just one times the other. But if it doesn't remain perpendicular, then you'd have to re take a cosine, right? And it gets really messy. So another part of this small angle approximation is that spring stays horizontal. All right, there's your equation of motion. And you can see what's happened here is that this used to have an m1 l1 squared. That's the... This is the mass moment of inertia of that mass. We've divided through the equation by m1 l1 squared. And that's put things in the bottom here like that. And it, it just makes this actually a little easier to work with. The mass matrix turns out to be 1, 1 when you do this. But it's still the same two equations of motion. I just divided through by m1 l squared and this one by m2 l squared. So these are your equations of motion, and your job is to come up, with, first of all, is just put them in matrix form. And you're going to do this in groups. Today we've got 5, 10, and 18 people. So that's probably four groups of four. Work together in groups quickly. Let's put up the equations of motion from this in matrix form.
In your lo in your lower left yeah, matrix is is the, is the oh the case what about I'm I'm worried about the M the, the case the case don't have any symbols but it's an M too there you go yeah it's just one there's a single there's only one spring so we just call it K. pretty good to me. And the last hour we did this and it went up and I looked at it and I just had one of these moments of just uh, cognitive dissonance. It just says, wow, can that possibly be? And the reason was this stiffness matrix, this matrix is not diagonal. Not, excuse me, I'm, I'm wrong word. This matrix is not symmetric. And linear stiffness matrices are always symmetric. So I saw this and I said, what has gone wrong? Every one of you had the same answer. Every one of you, the stiffness matrices are not symmetric. It's minus K1 over M1 and minus K, minus K over M1 and minus K over M2. And it, I about had a heart failure. And I've been doing this for you know, 40 years and it's always been symmetric. And all of a sudden you guys, unanimously get asymmetric. So I figured it out, a great relief. We divided through by M1 L1 squared in the first equation and M2 L2 squared in the second equation. The stiffness matrix, by the, the true stiffness matrix hasn't been divided through by the ML squared and it is indeed symmetric. Okay, it's so one of the things that's really helpful to know because when you're working these things out, if there's some, you know they're symmetric, you don't have to evaluate all the terms. You only have to do the diagonals and half of the ones. The mass matrices are usually symmetric too. There's maybe some exceptions if you start putting in gyroscopes and stuff like that, but then it's not very linear. Okay, so your next task is to, the way we find, the way we find natural frequencies and mode shapes kind of the hard way, doing using algebra is to find the what we call the characteristic equation, right? It turns out to be a fourth order equation, omega to the fourth. Find it. Don't solve it. Just write down the characteristic equation for this thing. That's your, then as soon as you have that, come up and write it down. So remember, you basically have matrices. This is the what you're working with. You've got something of this form. We've, norm we've divided through by some stuff to collect terms, but how do you go about going from the equations of motion to your algebraic equation in omega to the fourth? I want you to write up the, I just want you to write up the characteristic equation. You're going to get a quadratic and omega to the fourth. Just go up and write down the equation. Okay. By expand, what do you mean? Because we didn't, we just do multiply this by this. 
Well, just end up, I want an equation and make it a fourth. Just write, it, just write one up there. And if you want to simplify the writing, you can let uh, h equal, oh, and by, let's see. You know, I forgot to tell you something, a key assumption here, a key thing. I was going to make it easier for you. Let, yeah. Sorry, my mistake. Let the m's be equal, then it makes it a lot easier. And then you can say call h g over l plus k over m. And it'll kind of make the, make the equation a whole lot easier to write. Great. Okay, people are getting all the same answers here. That's looks good. Okay, so the next step is I will give you, if you solve this, you get omega 1 is g over l. Omega 1 squared is g over l. And omega 2 squared is g over l plus 2k over m. Those are your two natural frequencies. So now, Find the mode shapes. Find the mode shapes. If you know the natural frequencies, now you go back in and you get a Pardon? Yeah, keep H. If it, I think H will, uh, things will fall out rather quickly. Well, I like to, so I like to uh, normalize the mode shapes so the top one is one. And so the top, the top element of the mode shape vector I call A1 or U1 down through UN. And so if you divide out each one by the top one, the top one becomes 1, the second one becomes A2 over A1, the third one of its 3 degree of freedom be A3 over A1. When it, the fact that this, you know, you just solved this equation to get, to get that characteristic determinant, you said this was true. And when that's a particular kind of situation where you have linear, a set of linear homogeneous equations equal to zero, they're not independent. Remember from algebra when you have a, equations with constant coefficients and you have no, the, the, uh, they're equal to a constant and the constants are all zero, it means if they are not independent equations. So this is two equations and two unknowns and they're not independent. You won't be able to solve for unique values of a1, u1, and u2. You only be able to get the ratio. So you're solved basically. You found this value. You're going to plug in a value for omega squared and find out the values of a1 and a2 that work. That's what the mode shapes are. Let's let me pull you back together here, and let's run through this kind of quickly. You've basically solve this equation. You've said, I'm going to assume this thing is, has a mode shape and a frequency, you know, a, a harmonic. It's going to vibrate. It's undamped, so it's either you could write this as cosine omega t, sine omega t, e to the i omega t, but it has some constants out here called the shape. You plug it in to the, uh, you plug that into the equations of motion, you're going to get big, that you get back this expression. The two derivatives, the theta double dots, give you the minus omega squareds, right? And you can write it like that, and you can throw away the e to the i omega t. I've, in this case, I've expanded this. M is just that 1, 1 matrix, so this part looks like this. The k matrix looks like this. You can add them element by element. So this is minus omega squared plus h, minus k over m, 
uh, this one is minus k over m, and this term is minus omega squared plus h again, right? Times u1 or u2, the two elements that we're looking for. That's two equations. In this is just now an algebraic equation. Two algebraic equations. This times u1 minus k over m times u2. And the second equation is that. Now we know there, there's only two equations and not linearly independent. So you actually only have one useful equation. If this is a three by three, you'd have, they're not independent, but you need to use two out of the three. Yeah? How do you get that second equation? Second one, I take the first one and I multiply it up here. And that gives me an equation. This times u1 plus this times u2. That's equation one. I take this and I multiply it by that. And I get minus k over m u2 and this is u1. Um, this is the omega squared. I plugged in the natural frequencies that we solved for. Right? Oh, okay, okay. But for the top one, you didn't plug in the natural frequencies. Oh, minus omega squared. Oh, okay, I'm picking one of the natural frequencies, g over l. So this is up here is g over l plus h u1. That one and down here it's g over l h u2. And you see these two equations turn out to be. So this is just for omega one. This you want to do it one at a time. You just plug in one of the natural frequencies, and you get two equations and two unknowns, and they're going to each give you exactly the same information. They're not independent any longer. So you solve this one. Um, H it has what in it? A plus g over l and a plus k over m, right? The g over l is canceled, and you're left with k over m u1 minus k over m u2 equals 0. You've, this implies that u1 equals u2, right? This is the g over l in this. I'm going to plug in the, uh, that is h. I just put it in here. I've plugged in one of the natural frequencies squared. The g over l ports cancel. This is plus k over m u1 minus k over m u2. That means k over m u1 equals k over m u2. Cancel out the k over m's. I get that. It just tells me that that's the answer. And I'm, if that's the answer, the vector looks like u1, u2. That's also equal to factor out of u1, u1 times 1, and u2 over u1. That's, that's the mode shape there, 1 and u2 over u1. That's how you factor it out to put it in the normalized form. You just take whatever's in the top one and divide everything in the column by it. So to do the second equation, you just now go back to this plug in for omega 2 squared. The second natural frequency is g over l plus 2k over m. This is g over l minus k over m. The k over m's cancel, and you're just left with g over l's. You work this through, you're going to find out that u2 equals minus u1 if you put in the second one. Yeah. So, um, so we have a one over a two, or u one over mm -hmm. two being equal to one. So obviously, because you know u one's equal to u two. Um, but I don't understand the format that you're writing up there because if you just like plug back in the u, then you just get like u one over u two is equal to u one over u two, and that's all the right? Well, when you solve this, you find that k over m u one equals k over m u two. Yeah. So right. That's just saying in this case they are equal. Period. And that's, and that's all you learn. You only have two equations and they're not independent, so it means you only have one equation. And you don't learn, you're not able to solve for numeric values of u1 and u2. At best, you can get u1 over u2. Yeah, I mean, because they're equal to the ratio of one. So. Right. But so you can, in fact, you could just solve this for u, u2 over u1, and it would be one. I just okay. don't understand the form that you're writing. Well, that's my back in my vector format. I want to write the I, the mode shape as a vector. You solve for u one for u one. 
So you could actually do this. You could take, you know that that's true. You could say, well, top one's one, and the bottom one's the same as that. So the mode shape for mode one is that. If you want to do. Um, and the answers it says like omega one, and the ratio of a one, a two, one. Uh, what are the a's? They're the, I'm using U's and some of they used A's. They're oh. the elements of the mode shape vector. Oh, okay. okay, so we had put in the other natural frequency instead of um, <coughs> I may have just done too many steps here at once. To So our first equation looks like minus omega squared plus h minus k, k over m. And the second equation is minus k over m. And over here is minus omega squared plus h again. That's our matrix. When we add these two matrices together, the minus omega squared m plus k, that's what it looks like when you add the elements together, right? And we're looking, these are two equations and two unknowns. We're looking for the answer for some u1, u2 multiplied by this. So you multiply this out, you get minus omega squared plus h u1 minus k over m u2. And now let's plug in the second natural frequency. So omega 2 squared is that. Let's solve for the second mode now. Plug it in here. We get minus g over l minus 2k over m plus h, which is g over l plus k over m plus, and that's times u1, plus k over m u2, right? All that's equal to zero. This cancels this, this, and this. Plus one, minus two, I get a minus k over m out of this. So I have this whole thing gives me minus k over m u1 plus k over m u2. Which did I, I, I agree with you. Where did I make the mistake? The very first line, it's minus k over m u2. Ah, good. All right. And this is equal to zero. The k over m's cancel out, and you find that this implies that u1 equals minus u2. And so the mode shape for, two, for mode two you could write as u1 and u2 is minus u1, if you will. And it's obvious if you factor out u1, you get u1 and a 1 minus 1. Right? So now you've solved for the second mode shape. If this had been more than a 2 by 2, like a 3, by a three degree freedom system, you would get two, you'd have to use two of the three equations to get the ratio. You'd get two equations in three unknowns, and at best you can find the two of them in terms of the third. And the third one would be u1. You just divide all the others by u1. So you only get their ratios. OK, so those are the, those are the natural frequencies. Those are the mode shapes. Um, let's demonstrate it. Let's look at it. This is basically the system. and. You now know that mode shapes are one, and the two mode shapes of this thing are one, one for the first mode, and one minus one for the second mode. And the modal expansion theorem depends on this, this fact that the mode shapes form a complete independent set of vectors that are orthogonal to one another 
a weighted sum of all the mode shapes of the system can represent any allowable motion of the system. Any possible motion of the system can be written as a weight of, so any way I can displace this thing, these things, a little bit here, a little bit there, I can write that position as a weighted sum of those two mode shapes. So that, let's say I want to have initial conditions on displacement on our theta 1, 0 and theta 2, 0. No initial velocities, just initial angles. And I want that initial condition vector to be uh, 1, 0. I'm claiming I can write that as a sum of something 1, 1 plus another something 1 minus 1. So what do C1 and C2 have to be to give me that? You ought to be able to kind of do that by inspection almost. Like for example, just try them equal and what happens? So a half and a half, right? Great. So this, to, to satisfy this, it's a half, 1, 1 plus a half, 1 minus 1. And there you just illustrated the fact that you can represent an arbitrary deflection, allowable deflection of the system, as a weighted sum of the two mode shapes. All right? So that says if we, if I make the initial, now this says that theta 1 is 1 and theta 2 is 0. And what it's telling us is by modal analysis, that means the resulting motion should look like the response to initial conditions where I have equal amounts of each of those two modes. So there ought to be some vibration at omega 1, and there ought to be equal amount of vibration at omega 2. Agreed? Okay, let's try it. I'll hold one of these in place, I'll deflect the other one, and let go. Now that one's stationary and this one's moving. And a few cycles later, this one will be stationary and that one will be moving. So are what you're observing, could that motion, what you're seeing, possibly be a mode, a natural mode by itself? No, because the different proportions are changing, right? This is the sum of two modes, exactly as you said, equal amounts of each. And when you do that, and you have two things, e two things of equal amplitude, two cosine omega t like terms of equal amplitude and different frequencies, you get a phenomenon known as beating. That's what this is. Beating means that one vibrates and then it will get small and then you'll see it build up again and then get small. So if you watch any one of these, it's doing large and stopping. And the other one's doing the same thing, but actually 90 degrees out of phase. So what we're really saying is that the motion of this system, this is 1, 1, uh, a half, and 1, 1 cosine omega 1 t plus a half, 1 minus 1 cosine omega 2 t. That's the uh, total response of the system. Let's look at the first line of this. This says a half cosine omega 1 t plus a half cosine omega 2 t should be equal to the motion we call theta 1 of t. That's the first row here. This is theta 1, theta 2. So the first row of this, the first equation, is that. And two equal amplitude cosines of different frequencies, you can write as cosine omega 2 minus omega 1 over 2 times t times cosine omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2t. This beat phenomena that you're seeing, when you, when you plot this, 
and you, this is now for theta 1. It starts off at some amplitude. And the actual motion you see, if you, if you watch it, it does what, my, what I'm drawing right now. This envelope is this term, the difference frequency divided by 2. What's inside is that term. And this is, called, this is called beating. This is the equation for beating. When you add two equal amplitude cosines together, they give you something that looks like that. And one period of the beat is how long it takes to go through one full cycle from here to here. That's one period of the beat. Yeah? Um, how do you get those terms with the omega 2 minus omega 1 and 2? Well, that's just trig identity. Oh, okay. you, add, you just go back to your trig, take cosine of A plus cosine of B. You'll find out you can do that. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to, run, to go through that. And the other one is a half cosine omega 1 T minus a half cosine omega 2 T. And that turns out to be sine omega 2 minus omega 1 over 2 t times sine omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2 quantity times time. And that means that the theta 2 coordinate, what it looks like when you draw it, is 90 degrees out of phase. It's the same thing, but it starts at 0 here and beats, but it starts zero where that one started here. And that's what you're, if you look at one, so if that's theta one, and this is theta two, when one of them stops, you know, that's one of these lines, one of these equations, and the other equation is 90 degrees, so that one's stopped right now. 90, if, pi over two later, this one will be stopped. So the beat is, behaves like sine in one case and behaves like cosine in the other case. One of these needs a minus sign. That's a plus, minus, and plus, minus, and plus. So that's, what if you have unequal amounts? If you, we have exactly equal amounts of, of the two modes. If you have unequal amounts of the two modes, then it's not going to be a half and a half. What if it's like 1 and 0.1? Then do you see full beats? Does one come to a stop? If they're not equal, you'll find that the two sums of the two motions will look, the envelope will look like this. It'll be modulated. Each one's motion will look like that. It'll never go to zero quite. Okay, but that's beating. How are we doing on time? We're good. And let's see. Did we do? If we said the one natural one natural mode is the two opposite one another. So if I start go equal amounts in opposite directions and let go, it ought to just sit there and vibrate all day like that. No beats because it's the, it is the one zero case over there. But actually, this is a zero one case. This is one minus one. I, I gave it an initial displacement in exactly the shape of the second mode. And that means the two contributions are that one of those constants is zero. It's, there's no mode one in this. It's only mode two, and it'll sit here all day long and vibrate just in mode two. And if I displace it in the shape of mode one only, It'll vibrate, and that one's harder to do because I, I have to move exactly the same amount. That's mode one. And it should vibrate all day long in mode one because now there's no mode two involved in that one. But you can see it's already getting a lot of phase. Like it's hard to get for me to move my hands exactly the same amount. So I have a little bit of both of the other mode in there. But you'll never see either one of these come to a full stop. It'll, it's actually doing that when you get a little contamination of the second mode in there. All right. 
Okay, so I've posted on Stellar a little two-page sheet that just gives you step-by-step -step how to do a modal analysis. It's just cookbook. Modal analysis is easy. You do it all on the computer. You just put in your, your M matrix and your K matrix and you just crank stuff out. Um, next Tuesday, we did modal analysis yesterday just from initial conditions. Next Tuesday, we'll do modal analysis assuming you've got harmonic excitation and steady state vibration and do that kind of thing.